Hello, everybody. This is Liam Billingham. Before we jump into this week's episode, which is on John Cassavetti's opening night, I'd like everyone to close their eyes and take a deep breath, whether you're on the subway or you're at home. Just close your eyes and take a deep breath and ask yourself, Have I rated, reviewed, and subscribed to George and Liam's very good, very funny podcast? Because if you haven't, you should do it now. Maybe you stumbled on this when you searched John Cassavetes in the iTunes store. I don't know. But now is the time to do so. Take a minute and give us a review. I'm going to read a review from late January by Shartoff. Shartoff gave us five stars. And this is his review. Deep diving into the auteur ether. These two guys are funny and very knowledgeable. There are a lot of podcasts out there doing the deep dive, but this one is a cut above the rest. I'm a happy subscriber and recommend this one to other cinephiles. Shartoff, thank you so much for your review. We appreciate the support, as always, and we hope other folks will take the time to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. Thanks so much, and enjoy this episode. I'm George Fragopoulos. And I'm Liam Billingham. And this is... Oeuvre Buster? You always do it. Is that what our Okay, so let me see if I can summarize this in a single or single in a tweet. single single thought. Um, uh, accomplished stage actress Myrtle Gordon is uh, sh- sort of shaken up by the death of a big fan. Begins to take a unorthodox approach to the play that she's working on, which is called The Second Woman kind of putting herself into conflict with the director, uh, the her co-star, um, the producer, all of whom she has a strange relationship with, and the playwright. Correct. Um, and we watch the ensuing drama for two and a half hours. Yeah, so the uh, Ben Gazar plays Manny Victor. Manny Victor. Uh, John Cavaz- Cassavetes is Maurice, and Sarah Good, uh, sorry, uh, Joan Blond- Blondell. Blondell is Sarah Good, who's the playwright. And they're yes. the kind of like the principal kind of protagonists. Um, what did you think of this film? In general, I found it really fucking entertaining. Now, you texted me that you loved it. Yeah, I know. I'll, I'll, I'll stick by that. I fucking love this movie. Do I, you? It's not Chinese Bookie, and it's not... Is it the same movie as Chinese Bookie, though? Dun, dun, dun. We'll come back to that. When no, you say it's, it's not... not when you it kind of is when you say it's not um you're you're saying that because of all the kind of meta stuff on performativity and also that it's sort of about i don't know i thought about this film a lot but performance i think I it's, it's a, the obstacles that myrtle faces in her character's sort of journey throughout the film are very similar to the ones that the character metaphorically the character of um cosmo vitelli i feel deal with i don't think that's they're necessarily intended that way but i i think in some ways don't at me john cassavetti's made the same movie twice huh and just but in a I mean, that sounds rather critical you nope. mean in the sense no like no 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 a, i don't necessarily think it's critical i will say this so th- I, I love this film yes I, I found it entertaining from start to finish but again as with i think a lot of cassavetti's films there were definitely parts that i was like what the fuck am i watching i struggled with this movie to get through it it um, is long it's long it's two and a half hours when i say that i struggled with it i don't necessarily mean that entirely negative me- negatively i think it's because it um, you'd eaten something right before and you were like i don't i want to go to the bathroom but i don't want to stop this Was no that i, kind of I struggle? definitely no i definitely stopped to oh. i stopped um a few uh, times you mean like an intellectual struggle uh yeah i found it to be uh remarkably different from his other movies yes for most of the running time Agreed. um it's definitely his most polished film uh in terms of its style it's oh, and i would say that in a way it's, it's the most conventional film it feels like one of the first films beyond some of the story things where he's very committed to the like the shot reverse shot the, the very sh- uh, steady camera um yeah sort of n- regular com- regular kind of reaction shots um it feels very clean very in clean way. um but i think that the cleanness of it like if this is the right word, belies like a kind of radicalism in a lot of the, a lot of what the film deals with. This is the first film of his that's remind me of an Igmar Bergman film. Huh. I thought about Bergman and, a few uh, times in this film. I thought about any it Bergman in, in particular. Uh, Persona. Um, I I also thought and I uh, thinking specifically. I thought a lot about Bergman every time she entered her apartment and it's this wide open oh, space and, it's and empty, kind of and it's like. Kind of the set design in this movie is film in this film is very uh, I just corrected 
myself saying f- f- movie <laughs> instead of just film. If you want to have an understanding of my level of, of bullshit yeah. white male pretension, <laughs> it's me going, I I really enjoyed this movie. No, film. it's not fucking Transformers. Yeah, blah. Um, I hate myself. Apartment or hotel? Because Watch those peas, bud. Apartment or apartment or hotel because oh, hotel. it is hotel right penthouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah penthouse yeah so maybe we should uh so did you it sounds like you enjoyed it i think it's a really special movie mm-hmm. <laughs> no i mean i uh, in a good well, way I, yeah i do i, I really str- i struggled with it it's probably the film that i've struggled with the most since faces however to make it through there's, there, yeah but but i don't but i don't entirely mean that negatively i felt i felt it was like a healthy kind of work I felt I still feel like it's a pretty revolutionary movie. Mm-hmm. I still feel like it he really in these later films found something really deep. I mean there's a maybe there's a I'm wrong on this but the, and there's also a meta there's some 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 metaphysical things going oh, on totally. in this movie that are that I probably can't elucidate in words cuz I'm not really all that great about that stuff, but I felt it to be as most sort of philosophical. Yeah, because there's ghosts. I Liam. felt that it, <laughs> Sure, I was much more patient with it. I was it's sorry, it's a much more patient film than some of his other films. Um it's a really, it's a real, it's a real radical. It's very different. restrained. Yeah, there's a and, lot of restraint. In a certain way that the other films are not. Um, so I, I think it's a really valuable film, and it's, I, I tell you, I would, I would rewatch it, but not tonight. <laughs> you don't have enough time to watch a three-hour. No, film I really time. don't have time to watch it tonight. So, um, but, also, can I say, please? Sorry, um, I grew up a theater kid, mm-hmm. and um, I am like obsessed with ensemble and collaborative fil- art making, and like a big part of my my work the work that i do to get paid every day believe it or not this podcast isn't quite paying for that summer house but the work that i do daily is around building community around art and filmmaking and theater and all these things um and uh, i am obsessed with movies that deal with theater. theater and theater groups and theater organizations and, and groups of people together like this and so i was very excited to watch it and it i wish it had been more about that stuff but i think also part of the movie is about the loneliness of being in a group totally but i think a lot of it is about the theater so the movie begins in the middle of the scene of the right? scene between you, john cassavetes and general Allen's general Allen's on stage on stage um they filmed the whole thing apparently they filmed the whole performance of this play oh they did that's what i hear yeah huh which sounds like such like a cassavetes thing to do i love it i also love that it barely cuts and it's this open the, the first shot, yeah, and it's definitely from the, it's from the vantage point of somebody in the audience, right? So it's kind of like giving you a bit of distance, but also it, it is never pulls you out of the audience. You're always in the audience, which I think is significant because I think a film nowadays would um would definitely put uh would definitely like kind of pretend that there wasn't a play. I don't know. It would be a lot less raw yeah and there's this kind of interesting discussion at the very beginning about like older people versus younger people and right like his character in the play is talking about why he prefers to take photographs he's a photographer apparently of older people by the way that woman is definitely like an old-timey like greek woman i was like oh my god that woman looks like my the woman on the wall <laughs> on the wall oh that woman is so wow great. really interesting yeah, i didn't yeah. i didn't the f- the photographs are an interesting little mystery in the, the movie, but the, that's like an old Greek grandma. Oh huh? my god, yeah, the way she's dressed is like that's like a grandma from the Choreo. Choreo, by the way, means village. Oh, interesting. <laughs> like I didn't seen, know that. I've seen Greek women like that my entire life. So that I'm mean, like, that has to be somebody like I wouldn't be surprised if it was somebody in the Cassavetes family. His mom's tree. in the movie. As the 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 me- as Peter the, Fox. No, the medium, the woman that. Oh, the medium. The medium, or the yeah, the one they go to see in New yeah. York, and Lady Rollins is in the film. The lady, <laughs> lady, <laughs> lady Rollins. So, um, yeah, so, they have this conversation about aging. Yeah, and about like why he, which obviously becomes the, the prevalent theme, also or one of the prevalent themes of the entire movie. Oh my god, so much of, uh, aging is the most like the uber theme. I will but say it's th- kind of the least interesting theme. I will me. say this though, one thing that I didn't. I didn't like about this film and it's, it's it's a small kind of thing was how heavy hand I felt like a lot of the yes. discussion about aging was. It's one like, of the reasons I'm not as crazy about that as a theme. Yeah. Very little subtlety when it comes to kind of talking about aging and about how terrible it is. It's 1977, right? Correct. So Cassavetes is 50. She's 40. Uh, 40, 40. She's a little younger. Yeah. yeah. And Cassavetes on Cassavetes. Which I believe is what that Carney book is called. A uh, Cassavetes on Cassavetes. Yeah, he talks about Coco. He talks about like making this film. Coco. He talks about take, making this film and about kind of, uh, yeah, just about like how he 
felt like waking up one morning and like looking himself in the mirror and like realizing that he had aged and then he had to kind of like contend with that but also interesting like, system sensitive things is it in the movie or maybe just in the book sorry i'm just kind of they're, they're melding into one where he talks about how obviously it's that much more grueling for women to age than it is for obviously men to age especially kind of on screen for women to age for so. women to age on screen yeah. again so he's a lot surprising of me with his insightfulness totally and yeah. i i think we've I've been constantly through as we're we're getting we're getting towards the end here. We, we only have about three films left. Towards the end of his life as well. Um, dun, dun, dun. Are we gonna give him like a like a some sort of I don't know like Viking funeral? We're we gonna burn the podcast equipment. Twenty one beer salute. <laughs> um, I mean I'm increasingly I think I underestimated JC. There's a lot of nuance. Yep, he's a he's a sensitive guy. He contains multitudes. You know, there's Peter Rinaldi, our friend from uh, our, our buddy, is listening What's to this and being like. Yeah, you fucker! I told you this <laughs> months ago. We still have a we still have a really really wonderful uh, voicemail yeah. for, of Pete's to talk about. someday we'll get to it. So they have this performance. Um, it seems to go compl- very very well. They leave the uh, theater. She's swamped by fans. One thing that's nice about this that I don't think comes up a lot is that this is a play set during a tryout of a play in New Haven, Connecticut. And I think that like for people that aren't in that world at all. They don't. Sometimes they don't know that plays do these. Like they'll do. They'll be in yeah. Connecticut or they'll be in in uh, in California before they come to New York to prove their sort of via viability, commercial viability, and also to, to kind of get the a test of the play. Mm-hmm. And it'll run for a little while. And I like that the film does that. Like I think it's really. I think John Cassavetes is really respectful of theater in this film. It and seems I, that I, way. I, I appreciate that very yeah. deeply. And also he, so basically, so they, they leave the theater, sh- they're all... Sp- they're hounded by, the, fans. by fans. And you get a nice sense Her of dynamics. Um, ben Gazzara's wife runs ahead. She's clearly like had it with all of this. Uh, one fan in particular kind of approaches Myrtle and... Kind of loses her mind. Yeah, and they have like this really kind of like very right. brief, but very intense like exchange. And Myrtle gets in the car. The fan kind of like stands outside, like in the corner. Yeah. You, you don't quite tell what happens. She follows her to the car. She follows her to the car. The car takes off, and then there's a car accident right in front of her eyes, and the fan gets hit and dies like right then. It's and a really there. brutal. It's moment. a very brutal moment. Yeah. And no one gets out of the car, and it's a nice little indictment of like oh, totally. Hoity They're toity. so They're shitty. They're sitting there, and because they're all hungry. Ra- and Jenna Rollins is like. We, you motherfuckers like we have to do something yeah. about this and it's, they're like we're hungry like right. literally they're so like, she oh, runs into the hotel which is right down the street i think it's it seems that way and um tells them like you have to hey can we do something about this do you think she is disturbed by this initial encounter it seems like th- i think so huh it seems i think like, at the very least maybe she's been kind of by it, it but interesting by the way cassavetti said that this is very autobiographical that after uh they made uh woman under the influence that uh, Rollins would be approached by random women all over the place and they'd be like just crazy kind of you know I mean she really in love with her and what she did in that role I feel like this movie gets sh- short shrift I feel like the Opening movie night yeah the movie that gets talked a lot about is one of the influence but this oh, but is this like, one is, is I think it's more this one's more complex much more complex but also a completely different performance like she gives these two titanic yeah. sized performances no that question and they're completely different anyway so they get back to the hotel. She tells the front desk, like, hey, this happened. They go to deal with it. She she invites John Cassavetes upstairs. To kind of also, like, comfort her. They kiss. She pours four glasses of JB um, <laughs> and drinks and them. The and drink he basically begins. says, like, I can't. You're nothing to me anymore. Something, yeah. And then leaves and gets back in the cab and drives away. And she's left alone. Yeah. And then she calls Ben Gazzara. Then we cut, right? Called, it cuts to Gazzara. Ben Gazzara with his wife. With his wife. Zora Lampert, who's and- a really great actress she's great in this and um it's she's also great because it's such a subtle performance because yes. she's clearly fed up with her husband and with the fact that he is he's and in she's love sort with of this like other woman. shadowing she's like an understudy very never never made clear but she has yeah. some relationship to the process the impression that i got is that she was in some sort of yeah maybe like an understudy right um that she knew i, I was like familiar with all the lines totally so then uh myrtle calls Victor, right? And it's like three in the morning, and they're having this like really intense he's like, you conversation. You love you. I, I know I love you. Yeah, know I love he's you. He's like, I love you, sweetheart. I love you. you know, and and, and, and the wife is, is right, right there, there, and it's really fucked up. And she's clearly fed up, and she's dancing and trying to be like kind of cute and sweet. And then she eventually just walks out of the room. Yeah, and right, she's trying to get his attention, and he's like totally, totally not having it. This is my least favorite Ben Gazzara performance. Oh, why? I don't know. It's restrained. I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something. Oh, no. I think he's miscast. You know what's funny you should say that? Because he, 
uh, Cassavetes was supposed to initially play this role. That would have been too too and much. And Seymour Cassell was supposed to play uh, show Cassavetes. Oh Maurice. my god, better movie. But apparently, again, you got you, Cassavetes on Cassavetes, man. <laughs> Is this a book? Is it who wrote I, I it? I think so. I, I don't know. I don't know. Some some guy wrote it. But apparently, um, I did, which I didn't know. Also, like Rollins and. Cassell didn't really get along that well. They didn't and get, get on. They didn't get on. And also he, and don't even get me started on the Lady Roland. Okay. But he... You gotta work on your accent. <laughs> it's, it's fucking brilliant, mate. But he... Well, that's pretty good. That was good. <laughs> Thank you. But he, it, it's a Cockney thing. You don't get okay, it. Okay, now it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> but he apparently, um, Cassell, I think, had um, another commitment. Uh, he was probably on like the track and field team because that motherfucker can run down a hill. Oh, you know it. Fucking getting ready for Mission Impossible Seven, Father's Day. Geriatrics. Di- oh yeah, that's right. Mission yeah. Impossible. If you're 7. not following us on Twitter, that joke will make no that sense. That was no sense. Um. So yeah, that was initially kind of. So you think he's miscast? I don't know. It's just a weird performance. Yeah. Um. So then. So yeah, he next, has this awkward conversation, yeah. and then the next day we're at the theater. And this is kind of like during it's rehearsals, it's right? It's rehearsals. And she's clearly oh, this is when she, she freaks out when she's getting about getting hit. Yeah, so yeah. stay on that mic. So John Cassavetti, sorry, you just keep you just keep you keep falling out without the mic condom. I know. Totally lost mic condom, mic rubber. <laughs> um, yeah, so they have to do this slap, and and Myrtle doesn't want to get slapped, and she keeps reacting she's beforehand. Very intense. And scene. this is one of the moments where um I I felt that um. Gazzaro was was mis- was maybe miscast or maybe it's an intentional thing but I don't buy him as a theater director at all um because I just uh, he's too removed he's too sort of and maybe it's maybe that's part of the performance and again it's not a criticism of the performance per se but I didn't I didn't buy the theater directing in this at all like I didn't the way he communicated with the actors I didn't felt feel it was like on was realistic I didn't mm. get that sense of it what I'm looking at my notes. Sorry. Oh, you took notes on your yeah. computer. I did oh, okay. take notes. On that, yeah. um, in pornography. I'm looking at this. Eye contact is important yeah, when doing a podcast. But um, I don't know. I just didn't buy <laughs> I the. the I didn't buy him as a theater. I bought a lot of the sort of the things around it, like the boredom of working on mm-hmm. a play and the kind of sitting around that happens, and like the kind of people that aren't famous, so you don't you're not paying as much. It's like all that kind of stuff. I bought, but I had a lot of trouble watching these supposed scenes where Ben Gazzara is um, directing because it didn't didn't read to me as the way that a, a the director, director yeah, would. Yeah, just I mean it wasn't even that there, and there's no one way to do these kinds of things, but it just didn't read. I don't know. He didn't seem comfortable in it at all. That's why I think John Cassavetes would have been amazing in that part because John Cassavetes is like a born like John Cassavetes is like the image of the, of that kind of yeah, director right. and you know, Ben Gazzara I don't think directed anything. I could be wrong. Don't yeah. at me. Yeah. Peter Rinaldi, get at me. Did <laughs> did Gazzara. Gazzara direct anything? You know, though, I mean, I've heard that actors at times uh, inhabit roles that they haven't actually lived in real life. Have you heard about this? Have you heard about this? No. About this? Uh, well, John Luke Godard, according to that <laughs> book that I was overdue, is that every film is a documentary. So if you want to go down this road, Fragopolis, we can. <laughs> Jeez, I, I didn't realize I was messing with a, a chess master. <sighs> But I, I do. I will say this, and maybe you're, maybe you already said this, and I didn't hear you because this was is like, a song Charles Munson stole from the Beatles. <laughs> was still in the back. If you're not if you're not going to include that part in the recording, that won't make any sense. You're right. Uh, the, like the, the masculinity part of like the typical like masculine like mm-hmm. or masculine this kind of director. Right. I feel like that aspect of it, Gazara has like nailed down. Gazara totally is a uh, masculine oh, uh, totally. icon. He's yeah. a, an icon of masculinity. He totally is, yeah. What happens next? So then um, they, so again, like Myrtle's like freaking the fuck out. Yep. Uh, this is the first time that something's going to go terribly wrong. Uh, I think the, she talks to one of the producers mm-hmm. and they're kind of like trying to like talk to her. Um, but there's, but it is also an interesting scene too about like how her, how repulsed she is by the Obviously, like the act of violence, even though it's kind of uh, violence that's acted out, you know, that's, yeah. like, it's not real. But the fact that she's kind of completely and utterly horrified by it, she then goes. She's by, also witnessed a, uh, an accident right, that, yeah. in which a young woman has been killed. Right. So then she goes back to the hotel. Right. Um, buys a whole bunch of newspapers to get information about the girl who died, finds out about where she lives. And or, goes to And goes her. to, Yeah. And it turns out that she's, which is interesting too, right? It turns out that she's Jewish. Jewish. And they're having obviously, Very interesting. yeah, they're having a ceremony for her. And like Myrtle shows up and clearly she's just kind of like. Not, doesn't fit in. Yeah, it doesn't fit in because to some degree, uh, 
there, there's a certain sense that they, or at least people, some of the people there blame her for the death of Nancy, uh, Kind of right? an ex- unexplored aspect of the film. Her, uh, the, 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 the Jewishness? No, not the Jewishness. Or? That would be a hard thing to explore, but I think more the, like, her blame or her culpability in it. Because, again, I don't think, think it's what John Cassavetes is interested in. Oh, I don't know if I agree. No. Her culpability Don't, don't you think she's guilty? Through, I mean, that's kind of what leads to the apparition appearing. so maybe okay sure but i think that like maybe maybe i'm being maybe i'm being dull or adult adult about it but i think it's it's not there in the screenplay so i i sort of realized that this is a um as i was thinking about this film last night what makes this movie work is not the writing the writing isn't great the directing and the acting is really really great and maybe this is an obvious thing to notice about john cassavetes but like there's things going on in the directing that are, and I really, I really wish I hadn't forgot my notebook, but there's things that are going on in the directing here that are interesting that are not in the screenplay. I think there's a lot of, the screenplay darts around a lot of, in a lot of ways, but I think that's because John Cassavetes was such a confident maker of things right. that, you know, I bet his screenplays were really, I don't know this for a fact, but like, they're very like kind of, you know, disjointed and jumpy and like probably like, you know, tossed off. Yeah, so apparently they... I've never seen a book where it's like, these are the collected John Cassavetti screenplays, like you would have a Quentin Tarantino or a John Sayles. Apparently. Or a, well, yeah, because so much of it's like improvised. Right. right? Um, and he also like notoriously would like tell his actors, just kind of do your thing or kind of like inhabit the character. Yeah, so she goes to... Um, she goes to see the family. It's a very like brief scene, but it's kind of a really What do you think the significance scene? of the Jewishness is? If any, Ooh, I don't know if there's any like I don't know if it's supposed to be completely significant um, in any sort of like thought out way. Yeah. I, it's, for me, it was just kind of it added a layer of like complexity or a layer of kind of. It's a nice. It's a, it is a nice layer, and it also makes the because I we mean, don't know anything about it. It also makes the film more open right. uh, to me. <clears throat> so then she. So then they go back to rehearsing, I believe, and like Myrtle is still clearly like. She's upset. Out of, out of whack. Right. And then they have like this, she has a, this really interesting kind of conversation with Gazara about the character she's playing. Yes. And um, well, at some point also she says something like, do I look like Humphrey Bogart? Because she's clearly like worried about age. <laughs> right. Well, it sort of becomes more of a thing. And I think that one of the obvious nods to the death of this like 21 year old or 17 year old girl mm-hmm. is like death and, you know. She's still alive. This woman, this young woman, is dead. Yeah, um, and there's this kind of again. And this is, I think, where also the aging stuff really like begins to kind of take hold, where she b- begins to kind of think about her own mortality, right. and her own aging, and about kind of what the pl- this, the play means. And we never really find out what that the play's about. We get a sense that it's about it's about a man that meets that sort of randomly meets his first wife, and the way that it sort of sends yes. his current familial li- his family yeah. life into disarray the actor who plays gus i don't know if you took a note oh of God. that he's great in this the, movie. the tall guy with the porn yeah stash. i don't know if you can like you know quickly look up his name but i he's he as far as i know john tull T-U-E-L-L. really he doesn't appear in yes, any other john cassavetti's movies but he's like a breath of fresh I air think, in this thing yeah i think i read uh <laughs> again in that book that I won't mention again um that uh, the he, bible yeah he's a complete uh, a complete unknown he was like a truck driver or something Casavetti's met him somewhere no that can't no and, no no no, no uh, really it can't that's he's you. too good of an he's actor too good. He's no, so he's, good, he's, yeah. that guy's an actor actor but it, it's the porn stash it's no he's incredible in the movie no he's good he's excellent in it um and he also I just <laughs> accidentally called someone trying to look up John Tall <laughs> T-U-E-L-L that's staying in the pod it's gotta um, keep going. I also just love. Did you notice the uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken? I the, did. It was all over the table. Yeah. <laughs> so she's continuing to fall apart. I also went back, by the way, to uh, my copy of The Iceman Cometh, uh, and it's it's all over Eugene O'Neill too. In the stage directions. He writes like, make sure there's Kentucky Fried Chicken on the stage. Little, little known fact. <laughs> um, yeah. You lost me, bud. <laughs> So then there's a performance. And of the play. Yeah, and the performance goes completely and utterly pear shaped. Yeah, what happens? Um she at some point is I forgot is it with yes, it's with the Casavetti's, right? She's acting with Maurice, she's acting out that scene. Yep. Where he hits her. Um and she begins to kind of go completely and utterly. She loses her mind, starts crying off on stage, script. and he can't he walks off eventually. Right. Walks off stage. And then he comes back on stage and he's clearly trying to 
uh, save the scene right. as an actor, and she's totally, totally not having it. And then she says something to him on stage along the lines of like, you're a good actor? She basically addresses him as Maurice. Well, there's this constant tension that I think is really interesting in the film that where it's like, to your point, plays like... There's so much, there's like so much preparation gone into making sure everything goes perfectly. And the film deals with this, like the tension of, (laughs) the tension of performance and liveness and truth. Yeah. And I, I don't mean, I don't mean that with like a capital T. I mean, like we've like, it's, it's one of the things that the film kind of, there's a statement in the film of the way that like we prepare and we prepare and we prepare and we do this thing. And like the slightest little thing can set it off. And what's really interesting about the Mm -hmm. film is the way that like, she sees someone die. She probably reevaluates her life and like Correct. the idea of make believe and really the value of what this this kind of level of art can bring to people. Yes, and yeah, what yeah. it means and how it relates to like I mean at the end of the day these are these are artists but they're motherfuckers that basically ignore a dying girl so that they can fucking eat a fancy meal at a restaurant right. before it closes. So it's like In at that defense, point though, like, that's, that it was like the last. I'm I, as someone that it's as someone that plans their restaurant. literally their entire life <laughs> in around Haven, meals. Like they had to get there at nine thirty. But the facade crumbles, yeah. and totally. part of the thing that makes the facade crumble is like I don't buy this fucking bullshit anymore. Of That's like saying, my yeah. career or my job or any of these things matter. So if I say to you on stage, you're a good actor and the audience reacts, that's being present. Yeah. And that's being in the moment. And she says something like, "Oh, let's not forget that this is only a play." She literally How says that. How amazing it. is that? She literally says that. And yeah, and Ka- and Gazara can't handle it. Oh, the loser. And shit. the playwright loses her mind. It is a very fascinating, also, like to think about it in the sense of, um, like what happens. Like it's almost kind of like a like Pirandello kind of thing. Ooh, of like, ooh you like that? You like that reference, Pirandello? Ooh. Oh. Of like what happens when the actor or the actors like no longer want to behave which right? is like sort kind of, of i i think in some ways a uh definitely a th- theme of of cassavetti's uh performance and performative and and the way that like you know to be cliche and to not give him enough credit in terms of what he really was saying is like th- these films dang deal with performance and reality even in the smallest details in the way that peter falk happens to be at the premiere and yeah, this is yeah. an actor like it's just I don't know. There's a lot of self awareness, or there's a lot of awareness of um, what but these things yet. mean, and not like in a masturbatory kind of way. No, either. not really. It's especially not compared to how it might be handled now. It's, yeah, it's very well thought out, and it's not it's clever. It's clever. Uh, it's sincere. Yes, and um, yeah, it's just fucking good it's really good it's really good it's a really good film yeah so then so they have this breakdown and this is when things really start to kind of like go Devolve. completely off the rail yeah like completely and utterly off the rails and i believe this is around the time that the well she also again has this kind of uh, these ongoing conversations with gazara about not understanding the character she's trying to play right and it was also at this moment too that i thought like oh shit in some ways she's trying and she can't right because she just literally doesn't have the script she's trying to reconstruct uh this dead girl and she can't. And what we haven't really mentioned is that up until this point in the film, she's being visited, and I say that with parens, yeah, by this young woman who I actually originally thought was a young Myrtle Gordon. My first was like, oh, oh she's she's communicating with like her younger self, and you she's think, dealing yeah. with her issues of aging. Oh, well, Oh, sorry. That you, in a sense, like the, the woman you were seeing on screen was supposed to be. I thought it was be supposed to be a young her. her for the first one or two times she showed up. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying like maybe they, uh, <laughs> they like Carrie Fisher her like in Rogue One. It was yeah. 1977. <laughs> I yeah. Rogue Cooking One. Just, did you like Rogue One? I did. Really? Yeah. I'll fucking I will die in that hell. Ugh. Wait, can I, I, was it a great film? No. The second hour is great. The was first it, hour is a goddamn nightmare. Was it enjoyable? Yeah, of course. Ugh. It was a lot of fun. Oh, sorry that you don't like fun, Liam. I don't like fun. When <laughs> fun ruins like the. I listen, by the way, uh, I I don't. Do you know what, another little film that came out in 1977? Also, yeah, Star Wars. You Thank motherfucker. You. you know another film that came out in 1977? Taxi Driver. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> so, there's a couple of films that made me care about film. So this is. Do you want to know what they are? Taxi Driver, Batman, 1989. Yeah, and wait, hold on, hold on. Uh, Caddyshack, <laughs> Star Wars, oh, and Ghostbusters. Fuck. And Ghostbusters. Kindergarten Cop. Kindergarten Cop. Monster I'm, Squad. I'm the party pooper. 
I'm a kindergarten cop. No. Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, 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 it's a classic line. So then, um, Myrtle. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Where were we? Oh yeah. So with the with the, the first visitation, the first visitations in the dressing, dressing room. room. Um, and there's like reminded me of Black Swan. Ooh. That's all I got. <laughs> cool. Ooh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> not not as necessarily as good of a movie, but, uh, but it reminded me of Black Swan. Yeah. And do they? Hit, she. I know Myrtle says something to her, but I forgot if at this point the apparition doesn't like. Speak no, no. To her. She's just. Well, that's why I kind of thought she was looking at like a mirror image because mirrors play a, f- a formative part in the visual uh, landscape. Oof. There's a lot of mirrors in this movie. Is what I mean to say. Oh, I'm sorry. It's fucking. Woof. You can take the kid out of film school, but you can't take the film school out of the kid. I quit. <laughs> I give up. Nothing's good enough for anybody else. It seems when I'm uh, by myself. What's the name? Of I don't know what <laughs> song you're singing. Uh, the Lisa Loeb song. So then, um. The visitation started to get like more and more intense, right? Right. And I think they're in the, maybe in the first one also because I have a note here that uh, Myrtle says to her that is the dead the dead woman. I believe her name is Nancy. Says so something like, "I don't want to hear about your sex life." Yes. And I think she might also say something because later on there's like this really intense like conversation that she has with the ghost. Yes. Um, and obviously it's not a literal ghost. It's just like obviously something that's happening in right. Myrtle's brain. Um, she gets visited three to four th- times. I the first time is sort of the first two times are pretty versus innocent. Past, present, <laughs> right? Isn't that come oh, on is and this... know me better, man? <laughs> what day is it? And then at the very end, she opens the window. What day is it, young man? So then, yeah. So then there's another uh, visitation, and this is the one where she she's kind of attacked, right? So like, right. there's another performance. It goes again, I believe, hellish, from what I remember. Right. She goes back to her hotel room. While you're doing, while you're t- keep talking, yeah. I'm gonna do the the soundtrack. And then, okay, so M- Myrtle goes back to her hotel room after a long day of fucking up at the theater. There's she, a lot of saxophone. <laughs> it, it, there is a lot too of saxophone. Too much saxophone. Yeah. Can you ever have too much saxophone? Yes, yes keep going. Could, yeah, she walks into the hotel room and then she's attacked uh, by a, by a woman by dressed the in trim, by the 17 year old apparition, yeah. this little girl. And it's they tussle. Very confusing. They tussle a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, Myrtle gets away. Mm-hmm. Um, she then, because apparently, I guess uh, the playwright is also in the same hotel. They're all in the same hotel. Yeah, the playwright. So then she manages to get into the playwright's room. I forgot exactly how. I think she gets keys from like the. So you've skipped princess? a scene. Sorry, you've please. skipped a scene where after the first uh, two encounters. Mm-hmm. Um, the sounds. Remember when we used to be concerned about skipping scenes? Fuck and now we're that. Off? Yeah, we're that was before the bourbon. Yeah, exactly. Um, which, by the way, let me just hang on. Um, the playwright drives them into the city to meet with a yes. spiritualist played by um, Catherine Mama, Cas- Cassavetes, Mama Cassavetes. Who's like... Have you ever been to Mama Cassavetes? It's over on Fifth Avenue. It's a great, really good pizza. Oh, such great Greek um, food. Sorry. That's, yeah, that's true. That would be Greek food, probably. But Greeks can make pizza. We can, yeah. Pizza's kind of a it's it's a general food now. Yeah, it is. It's true. I would eat Greek pizza. Oh, it's great. Some feta. Do they have good pizza in Greece? They do. do it's they? It, it's done um not like pizza pie, but like square wise. Like grandma pizza. So they go have a séance, or they try to have a séance, and Myrtle just rejects it. She's but not But then she goes it. home, and she yeah. has another uh, appearance with this. But she also says, right? I think she says something to them, like, "Oh, I like." She acknowledges, I think, that she's. Did she acknowledges that she's seen it, but she kind of says like it's in my mind. It's in my mind. She's no. She's very cogent. She's yeah. aware that she's. She she knows it's in her brain. Right. But then when she gets attacked by herself, essentially, she, she freaks. She out. freaks out a little bit. And that this is when she has. She goes into um, the playwright's room, and she like beats herself up. She like smashes her yeah, face. It's really disturbing. She's a, smashing her glasses against her face. Yeah, and uh, the whale. Oh, uh, the wall. <laughs> The bourbon's hitting me. Oof. Um, and you don't really see the kind of the extent of the damage until the next day. Which well, she's got. A, yeah. And so she goes and she's, she meets Manny. Yeah. And she, they have an, another talk about what the fuck's going on with her. Right. And she's, and this is when you see her eyes and they're pretty fucked up. And yeah. we're, we're not far away from the New York transfer, which is when the play moves to New York City. Correct. Yeah. For the final, uh, for the opening, for the titular. For opening night. For the titular. But at the, the timeline's a little confused in terms of like it's in previews in, in New Haven. And then it moves to... New York, but the moment when it moves to New York is never really clear. Yeah, and it, it's at this point where Myrtle says something like, "Like this age thing has me like coming off the walls." Well, or something. Also, there's this quiet acknowledgement that maybe it's not a very good play. 
It's correct. Oh yeah, I think Gazara says that, right? Yeah. Well, no, I think no, no, I think she says it. And I doesn't don't, Gazara I don't, at this point also acknowledge or, or say something about like his own failed dream? Oh yeah, where he says like, oh, like I had an affair with this nineteen-year-old girl. It was amazing. Yeah, that that part's really weird. It's like I felt I, I was embarrassed taking my shirt off in front of her. And you don't know yeah. what happened because he's also kind of obviously in this very like traditionally masculinist way where like getting old means you can't sleep with nineteen-year-olds anymore. It's weird. <laughs> weird. So then he. <laughs> Wait, does it not? But I love, I love how like like this is like his the way he's dealing with his own mortality. She's, yeah, she's going through like a nervous breakdown. It's interesting that you bring that up. Like, no because kids. I think there's a difference between talking about because I think when people talk about aging, what they're they're not talking about is mortality. Like aging, it's like oh, I'm getting older as like this abstract concept of not being prime, but it's of being like in your prime. But like that's different from mortality, right? Because really? I only always ever think about the grim specter of death. <laughs> that's all I all I think about. So then, uh, Urban do- <laughs> and good night. But they do have this really intense and like beautiful conversation about what yes. it means to age and about lost dreams as well. Right. Um, and I don't think we talked about it, but when she earlier on when Myrtle went to the funeral, it was somebody there, maybe the the dead girl's um, mom said like, "Oh, you don't have kids, so you don't know what it's like." Or that she's asked, "Do you have kids?" Yeah, that's a really good and point. She says no. No. Um, and she hasn't really made a life for herself beyond the theater. Exactly. She's a very, she's a she's a, a theater actress with, by the way, something we haven't talked about, a serious drinking problem. Yeah, she's constantly she, hitting. She's an alcoholic. The I mean, there's people that say that this movie is about alcoholism. Oh, like it's a, like I've always known it before I saw it as a film about being an alcoholic. Well, those people are wrong. <laughs> are they? Yeah, because it's clearly about ghosts and how they're real. <laughs> It's not about that? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Maybe the ghosts of your addiction. Yeah. Well, no, I think that's a very astute observation. But I also, I mean, it's also hard to, because you don't see her really before. The, the fascinating thing also about, like, the woman is murdered or murdered, is killed very early on. So you don't really get a sense of Myrtle before. No. The death? You do. You do get her. You know. I mean, the first thing that you like see her minutes. do. Yeah, but it's enough. It's enough to see her be like, I have to go on stage and smoking a cigarette and being handed a drink before she goes on stage. Like, I mean, maybe this is naive, but like, I don't know many actors who are like, oh, I'm going to go on stage. Like, might as well get shit faced like that. I don't really think that this it's not a ton of information, but it's enough to know that she's like in a tough place. Yeah. And she might be a little bored. I think one of the things that's nice about this film is it's sort of a profound film about like, what does it mean to be an artist? Yes. No, completely. Like, And how that like as someone that personally has been making stuff for most of my life in various capacities in the theater and film and podcast, whatever that you have, you have to reckon with moments in your life when you're like, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> no, but get without, it. No, without question. Yeah. But it's, it's like, lot, I wonder if this poem will help stop the seas from rising and killing us all in 20 years. Probably not. Fuck it. Let me write it anyway. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to spend my afternoon like hating myself for writing something shitty. Yeah. Totally. That's but that's a pretty profound thing because most movies about art are like celebrations of the individual spirit and what those things mean. And this film is a little bit about like working on art in groups sucks. People are terrible. Yeah, I also rem- I mean I don't, I don't know what made me think about this. Oh, I guess I know what made me think about this. But I remember watching some documentary on uh, about uh, Sam Shepard and his work. Oh, the greatest. And somebody said, which is so reductive, and I hate these kind of statements, but I think it's also kind of at least something interesting to talk about like oh there's there's only two type of artists the artists that create things about life and the artists that create things about death and like thinking about this film and what it's about like i definitely think it's about death <laughs> completely that's, that, that's a bullshit yeah. it's also like so simplistic it is yeah but it's i see your point but the, and i see the point there. but the end of this film also i don't see it in any sort of like one can read it as like a triumphant um return to form to a certain degree um and we'll talk about obviously the final scene or is kind of like things are not going to get better. Let's really quickly get through the rest of this, this summary thing, because I think, um, th- and then so we can talk about the end because I think the end is the most compelling part. Of she, the film. she continues to, sorry, yeah, evolve. Yeah. And Sarah says, the playwright says she needs to go. She needs to be She's replaced. She's to be out of the show. They take her to a shrink. It doesn't, doesn't do any good. She, the shrink I, is played by the lady, the Rowland. lady Rowland. Dun, dun, uh, but when she sits down with her, she has another vision and she gets into a fight with the spirit, right. with Sarah's spirit, which she's actually... I just, think Nancy. Nancy. I'm sorry, Nancy's spirit, but she's just beating the shit out of the room. Yes. And this is, by the way, sorry, just very quick. This is like the most intense appearance. Yes. Because this is where Nancy like confronts her, like literally like walks up to her and says like, I love, I love to turn people on. 
I love sex. The theater is sex. Sex, yeah. And that's when like... <laughs> it's very weird. And the music in this scene is like way over the fucking top. So then we kind of... we move, The show moves to New York and Jenna Rollins is like... Or sorry, Myrtle Gordon is like, I'll be there for the opening night curtain and she disappears. And there's a long sequence of everyone kind of waiting and then she shows up and she's shit faced totally, completely and annihilated. she goes on stage and she can't like literally can't stand up and there's all these scenes and then we come to this coffee. they keep giving her coffee and then we come to this unbelievable 10 minute scene uh it's actually in the 11 to 12 minute range that andrew J- bujalski recently wrote about for i think film comment about oh, uh, okay. john cassavetes as a surrealist mm-hmm. where we're watching a scene from the play between John Cassavetes um, and Jenna Rollins. And we, I don't know if it's scripted or it's improvised, but the audience loves it. Right. And they're sort of doing these lines and they keep kind of hamming it to the audience and it sort of borders on like a vaudeville kind of thing, which is a Bujalski. He, he points that out in the article. Um, and this is when the movie kind of becomes sublime. Like it really becomes about something else because as you're watching, at least for me, as I was watching it, I was like in that scene, I don't know if they're improvising or they're doing scripted material or what's going on, but the audience eats it up. You mean Cassavetes and Rowland, and Rowland's, not Maurice yeah. and cause they're no, clearly no, going off script no, Maury- in the movie. Well, I see. That's the thing. They are going off script. And this is, in the this film. is so crazy. I'm yeah. actually talking about Maurice and Myrtle. They're clearly not adhering to a script. Correct. But there's a there's the slightest hint that maybe some of this is scripted. I, I but the audience <laughs> eats it up. Yes, but that's also a real audience, by the way. Yeah, it's a real audience. Yeah, Cassavetes had like a real audience there, and he told them to like act um, or just um, react as you were watching like a real play. So if it makes you laugh, laugh. I like, would actually. Don't act. I would like, guess that he wouldn't. Cry, even, cry. I wouldn't. He wouldn't have even said that. I think he'd have been like, "We're doing a thing." Yeah. And then there are these reaction shots of and God, what a fucking exciting filmmaker to pile a bunch of people into a theater and be like, "We're Strangers. just gonna do a yeah, thing." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And meanwhile, like he's getting these inserts of um, the playwright and the producer who we haven't really touched on. Gazzara. Like, oh, the, the producer's in Citizen Kane. Is he? Yep. He's uh, the he butler. Put- He's the uh, butler in Citizen Kane. Can you the imagine? Sled. Didn't he play the, the sled? The history of film is... No, stop it. The, sled and sled. the history of film is so short. Can you imagine? So short. Can, no, it's really short. Can you imagine this being guy. in Citizen in, Kane and, and a John Cassavetes movie? Well, Citizen Kane was what, 1940? 1939, but this is Whoa. 1977. I don't care. That's amazing. How long do people live for? <laughs> that long, but that's <laughs> unbelievable. He had a heart attack soon after this film. Oh, sad. So sad. Anyway... <laughs> You, you, <laughs> the so they're, 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 of you, death. you see these cuts to them and they're at various uh the you're watching Gazara and the playwright um and they're totally and they're they're stoic they're stu- yeah. they're, uh, they're, yeah, sort they're of stoic. flat-faced yeah, yeah, yeah. um so you uh, that's what made me think like this is clearly they're going off script mm-hmm. but the audience eats they it love up it. it's yeah. great and it's all com- yeah there's only one moment i think right. where it gets semi-serious but that quickly also good. um and then the film ends with a triumphant celebration of Myrtle's talent. And then the movie, yeah, and that's how the movie ends. And um, and that's how this podcast ends. No, no not quite. Not yet. Um, I don't know. I think that it's a really kind of exciting thing because it's kind of a, like she does away with the facade of theater. And oh, performance. Where, where like she tur- at the very end she turns into something real. Yes. Yeah, or she tries to. No. Uh, right. No. I, yeah, I totally agree. And I love also like a phoenix rising from, from the ashes. X Men: uh, uh, The Last Stand. <laughs> Next up on this podcast, Brett Ratner. Quickly, oh, did I ever tell you my Brett Ratner story? No, I don't. He's kind of a piece of shit. Oh, really? But I'm, I know you're surprised, but he cool he is. Um, yeah, Brett Ratner, man. Did you meet guy. Brett Ratner? I did. Yeah, Brett Ratner at the NYU bookstore. Oh, you did tell me the story. Yeah, we cu- I cut it from the first episode. He's an NY- NYU brat. Anyway, he's not a nice guy. That's, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. But uh, that's for you, Keith. <laughs> Keith? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love this idea. Of, oh, so C- Cassavetes said that he didn't want, and not that we have to listen to what the fuck he says, but he said he didn't want the ending to be read as like her tri- a triumphant kind of like, uh, That's how it reads. Um, to some extent. To some extent, yeah. I know. I think without question, but also the final three, two, thirty seconds of this movie are what the entire movie is about. Um, <sighs> Mike, drop. We have spoken. 
<laughs> Headshot. Um maybe perhaps yeah fatality but it also it also seems to suggest if you want to take it as if again it, it is utterly prefer, it is utterly um non-scripted they go totally Correct. off screen they go totally off script there's a certain sense also like well how long can that go on tell me more about that i mean j- just just uh, just in the sense that it seemed to me almost like a you could also read it like as a last gasp it's also interesting it's also interesting that the curtain falls on him concocting this like really you know like beautiful kind of thing of like all right we're gonna walk past each other and grab each other's like legs on the up oh that's right yeah, 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 yeah. and it's almost kind of like it, it, it seems to me like i wonder if that, like, that's like an acting trick um interesting and i almost i think that could also be read as like him saving the scene not that like you know like I get he's it. obviously not like the same so like, this, important this guy constant with, tension between like the performative aspects and the reality yeah if one can't continue if one can't build up enough i don't know how to put it but um do enough to get keep the artifice going then one can't be an artist very that's a very 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 actually deep kind of thought about this and and my the reason that i think this film is a kind of remake of chinese bookie is that what i think is really truly beautiful about chinese bookie is that is a film about a guy who who derives his dignity from believing in what he's making way deeper than anyone else's correct i mean he has this kind of like because he's flea a bag strip theater joint. strip joint but like he believes in the music and he believes in the art and he believes in all these in things production yeah. he believes in production and he knows that like the sort of um momentary entertainment of that is significant in and of itself. And that like, he's a man of dignity and he derives his dignity from being a circus master or ring leader of these things. And so I think when it comes to something like, um, this film opening night, you have Jenna Rowlands as kind of wanting to push against the kind of, um, the illusion of, of the theater and, and like the, the performance of this. And like, I think her point is like dignity is being in the real moment in the present moment of the thing that's actually happening as opposed to this thing that we've rehearsed 450 times. Yeah. Yeah. And like, we have to be aware and present of those things. And I think that John Cassavetes, it's a, it's a kind of career statement maybe from a filmmaker who spent a lot of time wanting truth, but had to get to his truth through like very, very deliberate, methodical means i don't know i think that that's sort of what makes it a very deep film is that he's like saying to himself like what if you throw away the script yeah yeah no without question yeah which is obviously like his entire thing too to some degree about like but his films are very letting... clearly scripted no though they are but i mean in the sense like i truly believe that he would like on set you know when he says like to an actor let's say like let's keep going with the you know let's keep sh- shooting let's see what happens it's kind of like um it's funny because the um God, I forgot. I forgot her name. the 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 woman who plays Sarah Good, the actress who plays Sarah Good, the the playwright, Joan Bl- uh, Joan yeah. Blondell, Blondell. A- apparently had a very difficult time working on this film because she wasn't used to his way of directing and way of like that the scene might not right. never end, so that she was really intimidated, uh, not just by him but about his like the entire right, kind right, of right. film process. Right. That's interesting. I mean, I think also when you think about someone like, um, like, well, when you think about his work, it's like he always existed. And this, I, I only say this having watched all the fil- films, but like, it seems like the films exist between an improvisation and a script. Co- totally. And I think what happens if you, what happens Exp- if yeah. you introduce, no, but really what happens if you introduce a more radical personality into the Cassavetes universe mm-hmm. than John Cassavetes himself? And that's supposed and to be Myrtle. And so maybe Myrtle is the, the, char- the person that he always aspired to be. Uh, to some, yeah, I think to some degree that's totally right. Well, I think they're both kind of different versions, and he, I think he says this at some point, they're both different versions of who they could have been. Do you ever wonder if, uh, you know, you brought up the really good point about how originally Cassavetes was supposed to play the, the, director. the director, and like maybe that would have been too on the nose. Like maybe John Possibly. Cassavetes had to play a part that was a little bit because his character whose name is um maurice, maurice. is a bit of a like Some a, people call he, me maurice Woo-hoo. he's a bit of a um only i sing on this podcast 
<laughs> Maybe he's a bit. He's a bit of a. He's a bit of a, 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 a. He's a bit of cryptic. He's a bit like of an enigma in the like the Maurice. film. Like you, you don't really get to know him you or don't. who he is, and like it's intentional. I think to some extent. Like I actually took a note at one point. Um, in the in my thing where I was like Ben Gazzara and John Cassavetes parts in this movie are the same they do the same thing it's a little bit um, weird to me or interesting to me that he was originally going to play the director when that might have been too on the nose like maybe John Cassavetes needs to to disappear into the background of this thing there is a really uh, interesting moment though where he says to her because she's clearly the star and he says something to her along the lines of "Um, I can't play I forgot what he says. Like I can't play. I'm a, just a lowly supporting actor or something. Yeah, like, that. like I can't play a jackass. When he shows up, when she you. shows up his, at his apartment, Cause, and then the the implication is obviously that he's like a working theater actor, which is interesting because he seems to live in a, he seems to live there. He's the only one that seems to have an apartment separate from everybody else. He's correct. Yeah. Um, so it seems like he's obviously. J- jealous of her success or yeah but they also have a previous established relationship yeah but that he's aware that in some sort of way that he's nowhere near her level well she's a star she's a star yeah full blown a star boy does she deserve it born yeah can we pause uh for a second and just like cassavetes is supposed to uh direct streisand and you know that and and a star is born you're bullshitting me no i'm not and apparently he like offend the story goes that he like offended her he said something like why would i want to direct you and that never happened are you (laughs) oh i'm totally serious no no, you're serious that actually happened yeah yeah yeah. i'll I'll find i'll find the interesting to think about a world where um john cassavetes worked with judy garland and barbara streisand yes can we have a moment of silence i'm serious for for jenna rowland's and um, how did she die? <laughs> She's still alive, dude. What the no, <laughs> but the, we'll cut that out. But no, I think, I think, I think, you know, to t- be serious about this, like, what a, I mean. She's There's amazing. no, she's unbelievable. She's so fucking good. Yeah. She doesn't work anymore, and maybe that's by choice. But like, I also realized that, um, obviously, p- you know, beautiful people are also the beautiful are, people are, are, are in, the beautiful people are insecure. I shouldn't have set you up on that one. Uh, I love al- Marilyn Manson. Can also be in- mechanical animals is amazing. Can also be insecure. All of it's amazing, right? Beautiful people can be insecure, but also like I kept thinking, like, you, you, like Jenna, you, you're gorgeous. You're Look beautiful. at yourself. You're beautiful. Look, at you. you're, you're you're a goddess. But it's just like it's just it's she's a such force. a profoundly talented person. Yeah, ridiculous. And like I don't know if you've noticed this, but now that we've seen so many films this year, and you sort of start to notice her tics. Like one of the most rewarding things about this process is like watching actors huh. do the things that they do again and again. Such but as she just she does I can't really do it on the but she does these facial these like facial expressions yeah. that are so specific and like she has a way of reacting and like there's a little bit of her part from um a woman, a woman under the influence, influence whose name um Longetti uh, Mabel Mabel There's a little bit of Mabel Longetti In Myrtle Gordon yes. Like just a hammy, Yeah Like no. the hamminess yeah. You know But it's amazing to see her Go from that character To this Like what the fuck yeah. It's incredible You no, know No this is great Yeah I mean, if, and I think fundamentally what this movie is about, it's about kind of the secret military base under Denver Airport, which we know is there. Area and it's part 51, of Area 51. Sure. And about the testing on the aliens. We all know what's there, bro. the chemtrails. They're poisoning us. People listen to us. <laughs> or Keith, at least. They're poisoning us. Right, Keith? So we got to do something about it. I guess that's that's pretty much all I wanted to end on. <laughs> Shit, did we get dark there at the end? Sure, no. it's, I think we it's got, the Berlin We got home. stupid. <laughs> We got stupid. <laughs> Are you saying all that stuff um, isn't real? You know what's interesting about this conversation is that I think in some way, when I, at the very beginning of, of our talk here, I've gone on a journey. I was kind of like, I don't know how to feel about this movie. It might be his best movie. I don't think it's his best because like, I, I think... I Are mean, you talking about from an aesthetic quality in terms of your personal relationship to no, it? Comes I'm, I'm difference. totally fucking the objective staccato scale, <laughs> which I have right here. How many staccatos <laughs> is this film? Uh, out of five? Yeah. Uh, 4.5. That's the same rating you gave to husbands. Yeah. So what the fuck does that mean? I can't give no. More, I, th- I can't okay. Give so let me let me let me say this. I like Chinese bookie more. Why? Uh, oof. I can't really pinpoint it. Who can really speak about aesthetic desires? I mean, I know Kant can, but that's Immanuel Kant. Um, Emmanuel Kant. Emmanuel Kant. Okay. Um, I think <laughs> this. I I don't know. I'm I'm. The more we talk about this film, the more sort of um. Sort of blown away I am by it. This might be number two for me. Or I should say number three. So Johnny Staccato, Chinese oh bookie. God. 
uh, you know John Staccato night. isn't a movie, right? It's a it's a movie. For so me. my number mean, yeah, one is film. still John Cassavetes on Dick Cavett, <laughs> and then number two. No, I really I really think that there's something very profound about this movie. No, it's 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 great, and in the, in the existential um, ennui that Ooh. permeates it, uh, as Sartre would say, uh, that permeates this film is also totally compelling. And it, it it yeah, I love it. I, th- I think it's very very good. Um, everybody should see it. I would agree. By everybody, I mean you, Keith. Keith, 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 Keith Cassavetes. <laughs> it's weird. It'd be weird. <laughs> I if... love the idea that there is actually like one of the tw- like the five people that listen to this is named Keith, and like, oh my god, they're talking directly to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's either Keith or Peter Rinaldi, who's now I have to text and be like, hey, I've referenced you four times yeah. tonight. Um, well, I think Pete. we should. We and should... listen to Pete's podcast too. It's amazing. It's really good. Do you know who he had this week? Uh, Ethan Hawke was a couple of weeks ago. Mads Mickelson. The Mads Mickelson. No, do you know you you know who Mads? Yes, of course. Okay, Hannibal. well, you were from so- Rogue One. <laughs> oh my God! But he, you know, like Mads Mickelson is, he's great. Yeah, and he had jo- Joanna Kulig from Cold War recently. Ah, uh, yeah, she told me about. It. Yeah, yeah, we haven't we haven't addressed on the podcast how amazing Cold War is. No, it's the best film ever yeah. made. Like I'm obsessed with it. I think about it every day. It's so good. And then they wake up and you turn to your wife and be like, so another thing about Cold so War? So I told her recently, I was like, hey, Cold War's coming to Prospect Park. Uh, the Nighthawk on Prospect Park. Oh, yeah. And she was like, did you already see that? I was like, what's your point? Well, I think we should wrap it up there. Billion? I'm Liam Billingham. I am George Fergopoulos. And this was... Hoover Busters. Peace. Bye. Okay, Edge. Play the blues. But then the Edge <laughs> just proceeds to play his normal guitar stuff.